Hello friends and neighbours, it's me, the Foul Prince, proud son of Norway, with a tale that will scarify your very bones. You may recall this time last year, me sitting in much the same location, talking about how I became mud encrusted, disenchanted and COVID infected at the 2022 East Coast Blues and Roots Festival otherwise known as the Blues Fest. And I wondered about how I'd be able to go to the festival going forward. Well, as Sean Connery once said in his ill-fated turn as James Bond, never say never again. Although in my case it would be, you only say never say never again twice. So this is the report on my trip to the festival. It's by no means a review of the festival. It's by no means an overview of the acts. It's barely in chronological order. So what is a Blues Fest review without a travel montage? It's a travel montage. This year, we had Levi come with us for the first time. Ivy wasn't able to make it. So after taking only one wrong turn on the whole way down, and that was because the Blues Fest volunteer gave directions by waving their hand vaguely in any direction while trying to chat up a much younger fellow volunteer. We arrived and went through the complex business of unpacking. This year I decided that roughing it was too rough so I went to the glam of the tent motel where I shared with Levi. Pricey, but I thought it was well worth it. The first thing we noticed was the absence of the jambalaya tent, which meant there were now only four tents, all of which were much the same enormous size. The loss of tents, and remember there were seven when we first went to Blues Fest, meant no smaller, more intimate tents like Cavern Bar or the Lotus Palace or Delta when it was a tight little tent, even jambalaya means that the more obscure acts are stranded in huge 80% empty tents, especially during the daylight shows. Also, there's no security in the tents anymore. The fast behind people still being allowed to take chairs as far up the tent as they like with impunity is galling. Oh, sure, the local radio star in Mojo wags her finger at them from the stage, but nobody does anything. Also, they need to update their exclusions. People think that when it says you can't smoke in a tent, it means you can vape. If you want to vape, go be a dickhead in your own space. I don't want to smell as bad as you. And if you're going to spark up, at least have the dignity to buy some decent weed, not this stanky, stanky local shit the white kids in dread smoke at Byron. The bill of this year was struck by cancellations and controversy. One of the most popular bands in the country, Sticky Fingers, were added to the bill. This caused outrage amongst the professionally outraged due to some 
flimsily substantiated allegations of the she said he said nature by full time race card flipper Thelma Plum. King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard then pulled out, which would have bitten into ticket sales as they issued an arrant virtue signalling notice in the process, and Samba the Great, a rapper whose talent does not live up to their cognomen, also pulled out. Festival owner Peter Noble took the noble path and said that an apology had long been on the table. What was in the past was in the past and some musicians needed to let go of things. In the end though, Bull's obvious love of money won out and Sticky Fingers got the boot. Soul Rebels, who included GZA and Talib Kowili, also got bumped over a contract argument. Jimmy Barnes pulled out while he recovered from hip surgery. Elvis Costello pulled out when one of the imposters caught COVID the day before the festival. And Joe Camilleri hurt his back and had to miss sets. None of these bands were replaced as such. The festival simply offered the extra slots to the already booked bands, which meant that some acts played five times over the festival, in one case in two gigs on one day. This is a big negative for the festival. In 2013, we had 183 sets by 146 different artists. This year, we had 134 by 70. Holding prices firm for a year as they did this year is a canard when they're actually giving you less for the same money. Thursday it rained. Nothing like last year, but enough to muddy up the tents. But that was the only rain we got. As a whole, the weather was glorious, even if a couple of the nights were chilly. Some acts were great. Nikki Hill, who got us underway, was, as always, amazing. Lucinda Williams, showing to all graphically the effects of her stroke, still managed to rouse the crowd to ecstatic heights and then sober it up again by simply opening her heart. 1920, who were great last year and have come ahead in leaps and bounds this year. Paolo Nottini, who is a brilliant, genuinely great singer. The Magnificent Counting Crows, lots of good new songs and obscure oldies. Great to hear God of Ocean Tides and the set closer, a wonderful holiday in Spain from a band in top, top form, of which I never tire of seeing. I caught the last half of that shameless showman Joe Bonamassa who was in sparkling form and caught his sinuous and sulfurous version of Double Trouble. Newcomer Jerome Williams, put on a great show. Femi Kuti and his music full of joy and energy and exotic drive was a real rise. Horns, twerkers and irresistible bass had the joint a thumping. I have a sneaking suspicion that popular demand may see him return sooner rather than later. Michael Franti put on his usual great show but had it stolen from him by Benjamin, a teenage kid with Down syndrome who came up on stage ostensibly to sing along with Franti but then proceeded to break dance and drive the crowd into a frenzy. Franti just let him go, he was having the time of his life. Trombone Shorty is my favourite live act of all time. The guy has a brilliant band, endless charisma and energy and a real sense of fun. That band, including the great guitarist Pete Murano, has been with him since the first time I saw him in 2011 at my first ever Blues Fest and it was on fire, totally hyped with the energy. I caught him twice the second time on Monday night, but given he was up against the Cat Empire, the crowd was so small, I just walked straight up to about three waves back. John Stevens put on a stonking show, mixing hits from his band Noise Work with the songs he sang as lead vocalist of In Excess post Michael Hutchins. You know you're going to get a top, top show when you can see the singer rising on the audience and finding that new level in his performance, and Stevens gave that in spades. Volunteers at Down Tools to go outside the tent and dance. The roof was raised and accordingly torn off the sucker. One of the highlights of the weekend. Day two was Good Friday. It dawned with me feeling very run down and frankly a bit sad and lost. I just couldn't see how I was going to get through the five days, physically or emotionally. I slept in that morning until half past 11. What the festival this year did bring home is a sense of same old, same old. It's a decreasing circle of the same acts trotting out year after year. Of the highlight acts this year, Femi Kuti and Jerome Williams were the only ones I hadn't seen many times before. Noble should have quit and let someone else take over when he got B.B. King and Bob Dylan on the same bill. 
He peaked there. It's been slimmer pickings ever since. There were some notable disappointments as well. Beck, surprisingly, way too much chatter from the stage, some pointless covers and a long diversion in playing a song written by AI. And he played Deborah, and if there's one Beck song everybody hates, it's Deborah. But it was nice to hear Tropicala and Sissy Neck get trotted out. Gang of Youths were to me even more disappointing. Their music seemed ramshackle and rambling and their singer, I have to say, dropped more F-bombs than I've ever heard for from a band. It just got wearisome. I wandered off to see Larkin Poe. Buddy Guy was another disappointment. I've seen him three times at this venue despite shuffling the songs about. It's the same show, the same shtick, the same jokes. Guy now has a co-lead guitarist to help with the heavy lifting and he is in himself a priceless treasure and one we won't see again. This was his last show here ever and he bid a sweet and sincere goodbye. Jackson Brown was an absolute damp squib. Now he did have to cancel shows in Sydney and Melbourne later but the whole preaching from the stage routine backed up by maybe three songs people who weren't hardcore fans would know. Running on Empty, Doctor My Eyes and Your Bright Baby Blues and a general soporific presentation didn't make for a great experience. There was a surprisingly poor performance from the usually searing Beth Hart, who seemed only momentarily able to summon up that phenomenal energy she can bring. Bonnie Rayet followed her up, gave us a lecture on not taking photos, and then played a set almost as boring as Jackson Brown's. That's what we pay our money for, Bonnie. I woke up Saturday feeling much more chipper. And I wandered around doing some shopping. I bought Ivy a pair of handmade Mexican cowgirl boots and had a gelato thick shake, which would make anyone happy. I think a considerable but understated part of the loss of vibe at Blues Fest was the degradation of the village atmosphere. Stalls, food vendors, etc. had been cleared out to make way for the proliferation of places to buy booze. One of the consequences of that last year was with booze so freely flowing, the place swarmed with drunks. This year wasn't as bad as last year, but that's probably because the crowd was so small you could avoid the drunkies. The rationale, of course, is there's more money in selling booze, and Peter Noble is inordinately fond of money. There were the usually highly touted acts that didn't seem to deliver much. LP was, after two songs, somewhat tedious. The Brothers Landreth were dull, super safe Americana. Great musicians, but too risk averse for my liking. Steven Seagulls was just an overfraught novelty act. I thought Lark and Poe were a bit flat too, and who could forget serial disappointments, the Cat Empire. Sunday saw the crowds begin to drift off. Jackson Brown on Saturday night brought home for me the greatest single issue which the festival is using to push me away from the festival. Stop booking activists instead of entertainers. You're just paying my ticket money to people who are there to help rich old farts convince other people that they have a soul. In my experience, the more shit they preach, the more shit they play. We did, however, meet our first ever Bluesfest drug dealer. We were sitting in my sister and Isaac's campsite having breakfast when this hippie hag announced herself. I mean, she looked like Stevie Nicks gone wrong, and not young, hot Stevie Nicks either, and offered us some magic mushrooms. She was a door-to-door -door shroom peddler. She left without a sale, but it's fair to say that certain parties did express some non-buyer's remorse after she left. The Monday was my and Isaac's birthday. My sister bought me Nikki Hill's new album on vinyl, which was cool. By now, the festival site was all but empty, the tents dark and yawning moors. The grounds would build up during the day, as kids on day passes came in to see favourites such as the world's sexiest vegan who uses his money to sell KFC, Xavier Rudd, and the perfectly adequate Cat Empire. Monday is usually the day you let all the lassitude kick in. But oddly, I felt energetic and curious. One drifts back to the question, though. Will I be here next year? The festival looks like it may, but who knows? Me? Who knows even less? The fact that I've lasted a year since I last did this astounds me, especially given the precipitous slide in my health since August last year. But in the end, why do we come here? Why do we put up with our experience being degraded either by the cupidity of businessmen or the loss of our own sense of wonder and put ourselves through the same thing every year? My sister has already bought her tickets for 2024. 
This was Levi's first trip and I hope he enjoyed it enough to want to come again. I hope Isaac and Ivy come with their partners for the next year. I hope I'm well enough or healed enough to come with them. But on the whole, I'll be happy just to know they're having fun and being part of something that was, for so many years, a big part of me. And I think that's the key to it. It's being part of something.